Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome my colleagues here in Washington and everyone watching online, all members of our vibrant Smithsonian Transcription Center family. Good morning. For our online audience, uh, I'm Janet Abrams, and I'm Director of Strategic Initiatives in the Smithsonian Central IT and Digital Services organization led by our Chief Information Officer, Darren Burba, who's to my right. We're so happy <coughs> to be hosting a visit by one of our outstanding Transcription Center volunteers, Ms. Siobhan Leachman. Yay! <laughs> Right around the corner, uh, just right around the corner, yeah. uh, she's come from Wellington, New Zealand, a hop, skip, and a jump away, and we are just thrilled to have this opportunity to hear about your experiences as a volunteer, or as we say in Transcription Center lingo, a vol volunteer, a mm -hmm. gold medal, medal volunteer. You've worked with us so intensively over the past couple of years. Uh, we're eager to hear about your experiences and to learn about your new life as a rock star, <laughs> having just come from Austin at the South by Southwest uh, conference where you appeared with our own Megan Farragher, project director of the Smithsonian Transcription Center, uh, Effie Capsalis, Sarah Sulik here from the Office of Public Affairs. Yay, Sarah. Um, and we know... Uh, we know the buzz is still on and that y'all got rave reviews, so we're eager to hear about that experience. Um, we are delighted to have this opportunity to say thank you, Siobhan, and thank you to all the volunteers who are watching today. Um, y'all have made such important contributions to uh, the success of the Smithsonian Transcription Center, and we have a number of representatives of our museums and archives that participate in the center, contribute their collection materials to the platform, and they're here today to uh, express their appreciation and uh, give you a sense of how your great work is um, being used <coughs> in helping support our historic mission. The Smithsonian turns 170 years old this August, and you're helping um, us all together achieve that mission of increasing and diffusing knowledge. Gathered around the conference table, we have uh, senior staff members from our 14, now 14 museums and archives, uh, representing the whole array of disciplines, science, history, art, and culture uh, that we have here at the Smithsonian. We also have uh, senior staff from our central IT team, uh, which we affectionately call at the Smithsonian OCIO, the Office of the Chief Information Officer. Um, our program today, we are going to begin with um, our CIO, CIO, Darren Burba. Darren has been an invaluable champion of the Transcription Center uh, from initial pie-in-the-sky discussions um, uh, all the way to today. Darren will offer a few remarks, then we're going to hear from Siobhan. Uh, we invite your perspectives. We'll then have a series of brief presentations from several of our uh, partners around the table, then an opportunity for discussion. And if anyone watching online wishes to send in a question, um, you are welcome to email, and we hope to hear from you. We'll then um, <coughs> conclude with a brief status report on the health of our terrific volunteer community that is over 6,000 strong now. And we'll hear from Ms. Chinsing Wong, who has dedicated her immense talents. Where's Chinsing? There's Chinsing. Her immense talents over the past almost four years in, in being technical lead on development of the system that we all um, are here to celebrate today. Um, so I welcome Darren to Great, say a few you, words. So I'd like to also welcome Siobhan and uh, our other volunteers who may be joining us online. Um, I'd just like to share a little bit about the background here. In the early days when we were first starting out with this, and we used to have our project meetings with many of the folks who are around the table today, the most interesting part of, of those meetings for me was always hearing kind of the feedback and what we were learning about those folks who were actually um, working with this online, and it, it just was amazing how it, the stories were uh, about the volunteers sharing things that they had discovered, 
in new ways that they were engaged in this with material that we never really expected. And so it's really exciting today to be having an event that's really focused on all about the impact that has been created and all those who have participated and made this into something bigger than what we originally envisioned in the beginning. So I would just like to say thank you to everyone for joining us today and I look forward to a great session. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you, Siobhan. Take it away. So, hi, I'm Siobhan. I'm a volunteer and I obviously transcribe the Transcription Centre. I've been doing this for two years and three months and at last count I've done 522 projects, transcribed over 23,000 pages and completed over 12,000 pages. Now, at, at this point, <laughs> I do have to emphasize that um, I'm almost embarrassed to admit how much I've done. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so the Smithsonian actually isn't the only one to benefit from my crowdsourcing passion. I volunteer for a wide variety of digital humanity and citizen science projects. And I basically want to tell you why I do this and what you guys can do to help me and encourage me and keep volunteers like me helping you. Um, so why do I do this? The main reason I do it is because I enjoy it. It's fun. I crowdsource because I love doing it. I pick projects that have content that I'm really interested in and also that I want to learn about. Um, I like to learn new things and then I also like to share what I learn as well. I also want to add to the greater good. So I want to play a small part in increasing knowledge. So what can projects do to help me help you? Firstly, be generous with content. If you're generous with content, I'll be generous with my time. Allow me to reuse what I help to create. The wonderful thing about the Transcription Centre is that I can actually download the transcription and then use it how I like. I also want to be able to use, oh, for example, images of specimens. So if I have a, a Wikipedia page that I think needs to be enriched with a, the specimen image, I want to be able to download it from the Smithsonian, upload it into Wiki Commons, and then put it into Wikipedia. Um, if you can, consider licensing copyright as freely as you can. For me, the more generous you are, the better. Also, I do consider this when I uh, consider where I'm going to donate my time because there are a lot of projects out there. Um, if an institution is generous with its content, I'm much more likely to volunteer for it. So um, I can actually get quite frustrated <coughs> if the content is either licensed restrictively or at worst put behind a paywall. And if I get frustrated, I get resentful and then I go play somewhere else. <laughs> um, so I want you to let me have fun play with the content, and use it however I like. Secondly, be generous with time. Spend time and effort creating a volunteer community. Talk with them, encourage them. Crowdsourcing is much more fun if I'm doing it with friends. Um, think about what you can do for the crowd rather than what the crowd can do for you. So help us work together, have fun, and be social. We're lucky in the Transcription Centre and that I have a point of contact if I have questions. Instructions never cover everything. It's just impossible. So let me ask you if I'm not sure what to do. If I love a project, I'll also want to discuss it. Listen to your users because we can help you improve. I also enjoy sharing the discoveries I make. So um, I want to share it not just with the other volunteers, but also with the people behind the project. So have a way to make this happen. The Transcription Centre has a, a Twitter account. You can actually engage with the volunteers that talk to that Twitter account. You don't have to be on the at TranscribeSI Twitter yourself. If you've got a Twitter account, come talk to us. That's what we like. That's the sort of engagement we like. Um, my favourite projects are those that spend time giving feedback about progress. They talk to their volunteers about the way the project is actually going. They also explain how the data generated is being used and they give me links to research and articles that use the content I've helped create. I think this is an area where units providing the projects can really make a, an, effort, an impact on engagement. Um, Communication rewards me for my time, 
and also motivates me to do more. So it's worth your while encouragement, you know. Um, finally, be generous with trust. Trust your volunteers. Most of us want to start immediately and learn by doing. We are not <coughs> going to read the instructions when we first start. We'll read them once we hit a problem. Design for this. Um, we mean well, but we will make mistakes. Don't confuse that with malice. Um, have easy tasks for beginners. The more expert, I'll become more expert the more I do for you. Uh, have ways for me to level up. Once I've mastered a skill, I'll want a new challenge. Try and give me a way to, to learn and progress. If you do this, you can actually create your own group of enthusiastic experts. If a project can't actually provide the level up experience, talk to your volunteers and encourage them to do it for themselves. Um, volunteers like to use the content they generate and let them link the data. So an example I have is, again, Wikipedia. Um, I like to write Wikipedia articles. I'll do species articles or collectors or articles on um, artists. And these can contain citations, links to the Smithsonian specimens, to the field books, to the diaries, uh, quotations from research that you guys generate. Um, make, making all these sort of links easier for people to find. Finally, I like having level, different sort of levels of difficulty. So easy tasks I do while watching TV. Mm -hmm. um, more creative tasks I'll do with nothing else to distract me. Um, this results again in me doing more. Um, and it's also one of the advantages of the Transcription Centre. In fact, the Transcription Centre is quite unique, I've found, in this, in that because it provides such a wide variety of projects, it has different levels <coughs> of engagement, and that's one of the many reasons why I've done so much. In conclusion, design your project so I and others like me can enjoy your content. Help us put into practice the phrase lifelong learning, Build a social network containing not just the volunteers but also the people behind the project. And if a crowdsourcing project is designed correctly, it can actually enrich the volunteers' lives, the institution that runs the project, and the content we will engage with. So, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Ann Van Camp. Do you want me to begin? No, you're fine to okay. be there. Oh, you want me to stay here? Yes, you could. No, no, me. This is a great spot for our online viewers. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ann Van Camp. I'm the director of the Smithsonian Institution Archives. And I just want to say how happy I am to be here today. And my biggest message right now is to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank everybody out there who's been working on this project. It's just been an extraordinary project to work on. and. We started out with, uh, you know, very kind of limited small vision just to see what we could do, and it's grown to be something pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really owe you a great deal of thanks. So three years ago when we launched the Transcription Center, our goal was just to see if we could engage the public in helping us to transcribe some of the odd field notebooks that we've been working with. They're all handwritten manuscripts that we have in the archives. and. We, the only way that we can actually make these accessible to the public is by not only digitizing them and putting them up as page images, but once we could get them transcribed, it makes it easier for people to search them and connect data and just do all the kinds of things that we kind of had a dream about. So uh, that was our, our little tiny goal at the very beginning, and boom, overnight, this was a success. And we love success here at Smithsonian. We love to tell success stories. And this is really one of the best ones I think we've seen in a long time. Um, with absolutely no advertising whatsoever, we didn't tell anybody we were doing it. We just, uh, Rick Ferrante put a few of these field notebooks up into the transcription center. We opened it up to the public. No announcement, nothing. Mm -hmm. They were completely transcribed by Sunday. Wow. So, pretty amazing. Boom. <laughs> um, and. I think that that was just the beginning of what we were about to learn, and I just wanted to share some of the other things that I think we've learned over the last three years mm -hmm. that um, you sort of echoed some of these things, but there is 
tremendous interest out there for our material. We have amazing content at the Smithsonian, and you're going to hear probably more stories about that from some of the other people here today. Mm -hmm. But you've already touched on that, that we have this wide array of amazing stuff. And we can reach a huge audience with this. And it's, you know, there's not one single profile for our volunteers. They're coming from all over the world. Um, and they're coming in the door right now. <laughs> 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 the other thing that we did learn, and you touched on this as well, Siobhan, is that it's really important that we enable communication. Mm. You can't just put stuff out there and expect that people are going to just not want to have that kind of contact with us. And so that's been a hard thing for us to, to figure out and learn. But I think that we all want to be able to do that mm -hmm. and do it better. So thank you. Um, we also were able to learn very quickly by allowing you to tell us what was working and what isn't to do some rapid development with the, t the tools and the platform. Um, and that, to me, has been really one of the more important things. And we're continuing mm -hmm. to learn to do that. And we have a tremendous team here who responds mm -hmm. well to these um, kinds of, you find a bug, it's fixed probably the next day. Mm -hmm. So we, we have that to, to work with as well. So from that very beginning of a few little notebooks, we have um, rapidly broadened the range of things that we put up into the Transcription Center. So we have everything from very difficult uh, handwritten notes that very few people can even read um, to Bumblebee transcription of their little tiny um, descriptions on their legs. Um, <laughs> and we also today have over almost 6,000 <coughs> volunteers working on this project. And this is just something we could never, ever do without our volunteers. So we really owe a tremendous amount of uh, gratitude to you because you, you have done what you've said. You know, you have made our content more accessible. Mm -hmm. You've uh, increased our learning ability. You've increased the diffusion of our knowledge. And all of those things just fit right into our mission. So um, I think that's just about all I wanted to say. Um, but we really just could never have done this without you. And we wouldn't probably do this without the volunteers. So thank you again. And um, who are we going to next? Um, Jessica. Jessica. Yay. Thank you, Anne. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jessica Bird from the National Museum of Natural History. Yay. Hi. So I just wanted to say thank you on um, behalf of natural history. The two departments that are currently using the Transcription Center are botany and entomology. And um, entomology, as you know, we had the huge bumblebee project. And I think that was a little different than previous projects since we did try to kind of make a splash with media in forms of social media and actual television coverage. Megan did a lot of um, different things to try to promote the bumblebees. And it was really a huge success. The volunteers did so much work to help us transcribe um, almost 40,000 specimens. So with that, we're currently working on getting the data out so that we can upload it onto our server in entomology so that it can then be put out on the web. Once it's, once it's made available, we hope to geo-reference that material so that it's even more usable. And we're going to try to keep the volunteers updated as the progress happens, so hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, for botany, you all probably all know Sylvia, um, they had, there were over 700 volunteers that helped with their project and um, almost 26,000 botanical specimens were actually transcribed in the transcription center and they were actually able to get the Spurge family almost fully inventoried, so that is huge. Mm -hmm. Two, you know, big projects, the Spurge family and the bumblebees that we wouldn't have inventoried without the help of the Transcription Center. So thank you all again. You're welcome. How about our team from the National Museum yeah, of African American History and Culture? Come on down. Yay. 
I bought three because it takes a village to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Not only by the volunteers, but also within the unit, yeah. because everyone has picked up a little piece. You don't have one person who's dedicated to it full time. One one staff person. No, so we have we have several people who spend part of their day. That's wonderful. <laughs> and y'all are hearing from Laura Coyle, who's head of collections. Uh, cataloging and Catalog digitization. Thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, perhaps y'all could introduce, yeah. you will introduce yourselves and give um, our viewers, our friends online, a sense of the role that each of you play. Yes. Yeah. So, hi, Siobhan. I'm Courtney Blizzy. Nice I'm meeting. a museum specialist at the African American History and Culture Museum. And I started about a year ago, and I work on Laura's team as a cataloger and um, help out with all a bunch of other digital initiatives we're, we're using. And the rest of the Transcription Center core team is Camila Sennett mm -hmm. and Doug Brunley, and they'll talk in just a minute. Um, but I did want to thank Laura for giving us this opportunity because she really hit on the point that what we have done since the beginning, and it'll be a year in June, is um, work as a team. We're trying to open a museum, so mm -hmm. our <laughs> resources are being pulled in a thank you <laughs> in a lot of in a lot of different directions. And so it's really um, it takes all of us to make sure that we can get up our goal. And we don't have the numbers that everybody does since we're the newbies. Um, was to at least do a project about a month so that we can average um, a year because and so that it corresponds with some of the um, work we're doing on our exhibits as right. well. Yeah cataloging to try and get everything available online that'll be in the museum. So there's there was a strategic approach to try and streamline a little bit of the some of the workload. Um, so just as a brief overview, some of the highlights in our experience was we did uh, Google Hangout, which you yeah. very, very graciously uh, participated in mm -hmm. and tweeted about and got out there with um, one of our museum specialists, uh, Tulani. Mm -hmm. um, and she uh, talked about our James Baldwin collection. Mm -hmm. And that's another approach we're using is to look at collections as a whole at the Transcription Center versus just putting in um, individual objects. So mm -hmm. we're trying to give the volunteers an overview of what we have. Um, and that was really successful. We have, I have the number, over 300 views on the YouTube video alone, which was really great. And um, we are pr uh, potentially, actually probably, because our curator, Paul Gardulo, is really excited to do a Google Hangout. So we'll have more, um, more right. stuff for <laughs> coming and maybe over the summer, um, some more uh, in interactions like that. Um, and I just do want to thank you from our team. Um, we had Marian Anderson's diary up mm. recently, mm. and um, our curator, Dwandalyn Reese, who uh, is in charge of that object and our ex exhibition on musical crossroads, turned to me when she found out that it was done immediately in a day and said, I'm so excited, I can now find a page for the exhibit to put on there. Wow. So your okay. work is being yeah. used in yeah. our museum. Right. So thank you. <laughs> And then speaking of your level up experience, we have a couple of new challenges coming your way that my <laughs> colleagues are going to talk about. Right. And Camille is going to talk about what we just placed up earlier last over yeah. the weekend or last last Friday. Yes, yes. On, yes. on Transcription Center. So what we put on our Transcription Center last Friday was Benjamin Vanderhoek Almanac from I think 1793. Um, and it's been one of the slower moving projects that we placed up there only because it has a series of tables. And so we're mm -hmm. in the process of figuring, figuring out what the best way is to help our volunteers transcribe Tables that, kind, hard. that yeah. kind of data. And yeah. the reason why we're, um, it's so important for us to be able to transcribe that kind of data is for our upcoming um, Freedmen's Bureau project, which is enormous and it's going to take, we think, maybe a year or more to transcribe. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is kind of helping us figure out how we can best get this out to our volunteers and help them help us. Yep. So our, we're excited to announce today, really, it's the first time we've talked about this. Um, <coughs> starting this summer, um, we're going to be launching a massive project to start transcribing all 1.2 million records of the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, wow. We are currently, uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture is in partnership with FamilySearch.org and the National Archives and Records Administration. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be going state by state. And um, uh, everything from letters and contracts, um, medical records, marriage records, school records, bank records, um, of the Freedmen's Bureau, which was um, an organization during Reconstruction mm -hmm. in the South that um, helped uh, recently freed slaves 
um, get back on their feet and uh, find jobs and you know participate in society. So it's a it's a massive project. Um, like I said, 1.2 million individual documents um, that we're going to be starting with. Um, planning to start with the state of North Carolina and going state by state. Um, and we're just going to see how it goes. Okay. <laughs> we're looking at probably be a couple year long project, yeah, but yeah. we're very excited to announce that and we hope that um, you'll participate and we're looking forward to talking to you tomorrow about it. Yeah. Right. And we just want to say thank you to everyone, all the volunteers that are watching, especially Siobhan who's here with us today, and most importantly to Megan Farreter, mm. um, who honestly has held, held all of our hands <laughs> and told us, you know, maybe you really want to try it this way, or and has been such a great um, advocate for our team. And so thank you so much, really, for all of your help, Megan. Um, our, yeah, our social media team, you know, really takes the initiative from what Megan is able to produce and try and out there and communicate. And we also want to um, uh, say thank you to Shinsen and the rest of the OCIO team from the technical standpoint of view. You've helped us out greatly, and we really could we don't... Um, um, have a lot of the resources right now in place, and without you guys, it wouldn't have been um, able. To. And that's it from us. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rusty Russell, from also from the Natural History Museum, joining Jessica and Sylvia and others to talk about the Field Books Project. And Paul and Robert. Yeah, we're going to circle back to the field book project that Ann Van Camp mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. But before we do, I'm Rusty Russell. I'm head of collections in the Department of Botany and Natural History. And I wanted to say that this is especially exciting for me right now because <clears throat> prior to this time, I've counted myself lucky to have met people like Brooks Robinson and Mother Teresa. But now I can add Shivani <laughs> to that very short list. And I want to thank you very much. Thank Your you. reputation <laughs> precedes you by millennia. Oh, I'm blushing. <laughs> um, a little over six years ago, uh, the Field Book Project took shape. My colleague, Ann Van Camp, the director of the Smithsonian Institution Archives, and tremendous support from OCIO, Darren Verba, thank you. Um, and, uh, and a number of individuals throughout natural history and other places. The concept of the field book project was actually quite simple, but it was interesting that it even had to come to be in the way that it did, because prior to that, we had been investing lots of money in digital imaging and collecting data on natural history specimens, and yet the source of that information the field books, the original collecting events, the original documentation of those collecting events was not being addressed at all. In fact, in some places, they were squirreled away in people's offices, um, they were in boxes in basements, uh, many were at the SI archives, uh, but the, the real goal at the beginning was to find out what the heck we had and catalog it. And <clears throat> just from Botany's perspective, we had on the shelves in our library a little over 600 field books originally, and when we put out the call to bring out your dad, it turned out to be far more than 1,100, mm -hmm. and we're still counting. And this is true across most of the, uh, the disciplines within natural history. The, uh, the next step, of course, was to catalog them, as I said, at a level of detail greater than your normal finding guide in an archives, because as biologists, you're looking for a little bit more specific information. The number of times I've gone to a finding guide and said, well, I might be interested in that, but I'm not sure. Now, more often, you're going to be sure. The next step, of course, was to digitally image it, scan it at the page level so that we could have it transcribed. Because until we had it word searchable, the utility of these objects and, and the images themselves uh, weren't as great. To be able to go in and do word level searches to connect information from multiple field books, not all of which might be at the Smithsonian. One of the long range goals, in fact, was an international registry of field books, something that in the queries that I've been getting over many years, we knew was really important. An individual's career is not necessarily documented in a single location. Uh, so bringing that kind of, of content together was very important. If you're looking for a challenge, the next level beyond transcribing it 
um, <coughs> is marking it up. Marking it up in such a way that we can recognize kinds of content and conduct what we call a connecting content activity, which is a, uh, a, uh, a term that goes back a whole five years um, to uh, a project, an IMLS project that started to in fact take data from field books, data from collections, data from subsequent publications, and figure out the inherent connections between them. Mm -hmm. um, and marking up the text is a very effective way of doing that. We're not at the point of implementing that, but that's where we hope to be heading. Um, the, um, the SI Archives has put in tremendous resources into this. Ann mentioned Rick Ferrante. Um, thanks, Rick. Uh, Megan Ferreter, uh, Kira Cherix, who's not here, uh, taking care of a lot of the, the imaging activities. And a host of conservators and interns uh, have worked on this project over a long time. The first project manager, Carolyn Sheffield, and her staff, Sonoy Nakasoni, and now Leslie Perilla. Um, but the, the end point of this diatribe is that the International Registry is now starting to take shape. The Biodiversity Heritage Library has sort of taken the brand of the Field Book Project under its wing and begun to install it into the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which up till now was only about uh, natural history books. It's now going to include natural history field books, and the, um, the uh, content will be not simply from SI, but from other organizations. So the work that the volunteers are doing in the Transcription Center basically supports all of this. It's not going to happen at the next level up, the important levels, until we get it all yeah. transcribed. Yeah. So thank you yeah. from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank I you. love it. I love yeah. it. So. Yeah. Our final presentation will be from Kelly Quinn, uh, representing the Archives of American Art. It's really a great pleasure to meet you in person. Um, thank you so much for all of your labor and creativity. And thank you. We're really grateful to I'm, you. I'm taking all the thanks, not just for yes, me, of course, but um, for yeah, everyone so oh, yeah. and, and, and the, all the volunteers. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're their representative. Yeah. Yeah. And you're embodying yeah. their yeah. Yeah. work. Um, and also, we're really indebted to Megan Farrader for your leadership and creativity mm -hmm. in helping shape all of this and really build and support the community. Yes, I agree. Um, it's, um, humbling to be with you both today. At the Archives of American Art, our uh, approach to trans the Transcription Center has been twofold. First, our transcription part projects are part of an ongoing work to digitize collections for presentation on the web, making them available to researchers and others who are interested in the history of American art. Karen Weiss, our head of digital operations, sees the act of transcription as one of the final steps in our digitization program to make our holdings accessible, legible, and machine readable. Volunteers have advanced this effort by working with folders of the materials, including the entire run of the Arthur Dove and Helen Tour Dove uh, diary. Mm. Technical developments by OCIO to import folder level <coughs> contributions have really made a difference and it helped us in being able to realize this goal. And thank you, Chinsen, for making that happen. That's really been incredible and a tremendous uh, asset for us. This technique, importing folder level contributions, corresponds with our ongoing large scale folder level digitization efforts that have been supported largely by the Terra Foundation and Carter. Our uh, second major way that we've used, and maybe this is the more fun way, um, that we've used uh, uh, projects in the Transcription Center is to augment the exhibitions in our gallery and our, pre our presentation program. Our gallery is located um, up the street here at the Lawrence A. Fleischmann um, Gallery in the Donald W. Reynolds Center. These exhibitions have include Monuments Men on the Front Lines to Save Your Art from 1942 to 1946, a Day in the Life, uh, Artist Diaries from the Archives of American Art, and The Art of Handwriting. The last exhibition there, The Art of Highwrite, Handwriting, highlighted artist handwritten letters analyzed and contextualized by authorities on, their, on American art, including art historians, biographers, and a few artists themselves. We've contributed these materials to the Transcription Center, and volunteers have transcribed nearly 60 letters extending our reach of our documents beyond the five cases in the Reynolds Center. 
and we're delighted to learn, we've been delighted to learn how the women and men of the Transcription Center engaged with the documents, sharing their own observations mm -hmm. and interpretations in addition to the expert. They're a different kind of expert in this matter. We benefited from their labor using the volunteers' work as the first draft of the verbatim transcripts to be included in this forthcoming book. Um, this is an advanced copy to be published it? next month by Princeton Architectural oh, Press. Um, and so we're really thrilled to be able to present this material um, as a physical product. Um, and in fact, our uh, director, Kate Hall, dedicated this book in part to the volunteers Aww. because we're so indebted Yay. to your Yay. work. Yay. Your work has enabled and enhanced our mission to collect and preserve and to make accessible the primary source documents um, for the history of visual arts in America. So we're really grateful to you and, and to the uh, other volunteers in our community. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. everyone and now uh, we'd like to have a few moments of discussion um, and I welcome my colleagues here to pose uh, questions you might have um, and Megan may have received a couple of questions or comments from online I, I wanted to lead off if I might mm -hmm. uh, chairs privilege here tell us uh, about a few of the discoveries <coughs> you made through this process okay um, the, the easiest one that I can come up with that covers a ho the whole range or a lot of the range of what I do would be the wonderful Rose E. Collar. Now she, I found out about her both by transcribing the botany specimens and also two catalogues by um, Joseph Nelson Rose um, about his collecting uh, specimens of cacti. She would send in specimens to him, both for identification and also for his general collection at the museum. And I was transcribing these and got curious because a lot of women were being mentioned as collectors in the 1920s and I didn't realise that women would be collecting specimens for the Smithsonian <laughs> in the 1920s. So I thought, oh, this is an interesting lady, I'll research her. So I found out that she was actually the first paid botanist of the Grand Canyon National Park. Wow that unsurprisingly she didn't have a Wikipedia page, which I felt obliged to rectify. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> um, so then I went off on this lovely little tangent, stop transcribing, went off on this lovely little tangent and started researching her and actually went out and contacted her old college, which is now Linwood University, and their archivist wrote back, very excited, obviously doesn't often get out, <laughs> <laughs> and, and said, oh, oh, let me have a, a find out what I can for you. And he got me some articles of old um, yearbooks that she had of featuring her and also found some botany specimens that she had sent her college um, herbarium, their very small college herbarium, and he sent me photos of them. So I thought, oh, this is great. So I did the research. I also contacted a couple of other places. And then I thought, well, other people would better know about this. So I contacted the um, Desert Botanical Garden in Arizona because they hold her papers. And I also contacted the um, Grand National, uh, sorry, Grand Canyon National Museum because they hold most of her, most of her grand um, the specimens. The specimens for that just that particular area wow. because a lot of them are also in the Smithsonian. Um, and they wrote back, they're very excited and very happy to be contacted. And then I published my article and put it out on Twitter. And thought <laughs> that would be the end of it. I now know everything I can about it, that's lovely. Except on Twitter, the British and Irish Botanical Society came back and said, wow, this is really interesting. Would you write us a blog about your transcribing, <laughs> your research, and her? And so I thought, oh, okay. So I went away and did more research <laughs> to do this sort of Amazing. blog for them and found in JSTOR Global Plants Database that they did have some specimens of her, including some type specimens, but the locality that they listed was wrong. Was wrong. Was wrong. They said she collected it in Australia, and I thought, that can't be right, because as far as I was aware, she never left the States. She was in the States her entire life. She had a husband here. She travelled within a very small, well, what I regard as a very small area of the state. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so... And so I thought, there's no way she could have gone to Australia to collect these things. It, the location of these specimens that you've got in your database must be wrong. So I contacted JSTOR and they say, no, we can't actually change it. You need to go back to the herbarium that provided the specimen. 
So I went back and wrote to Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden. <coughs> Did you know that this type of specimen is collected by this collector I'm interested in and the location that you've listed in your database I believe is incorrect. Unfortunately, I can't get to the specimen sheet to actually investigate the label on it. But could you double check it for me because I'm pretty sure you're wrong. <laughs> and, and provided them with all the information. And then they came back to me and said, oh, yep, you're right. We've had this little bug in our system. It, it does funny things with the location. We've corrected it, and it will upload into JSTOR Global Plants and will be corrected. Oh. So it just gives you an example of a little side track that then sort of just explodes That's about fantastic. what you can do. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions around the table? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a great question. Why <laughs> she's working for free? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm doing on what I want to work on. That's the nice thing about it. <laughs> Megan, do we? Yes, we have some questions from the crowd, and I also want to recognize some of our volunteers who are watching in the live stream. So, hi to Michelle. Uh, hi to Amy. Hi to Julia. Hi. Uh, hi to Ed, who's watching and emailing in, and Irv. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Hi to Kate. Um, so one question that is very interesting comes from Irv, who is uh, contributing quite a long time and has many wonderful suggestions for improving the system. But one of his questions is actually looking outward. Can the volunteers have a role in helping to expand the scope of the transcription center to other organizations, be it the U.S. Postal Service, other places that are beyond the Smithsonian? So if anyone has any ideas or thoughts about that, that would be really wonderful to hear. Are you thinking too small? Are you thinking only are we about thinking too small? Well, clearly we're already partnering. We are. Uh, with, uh, on the Freedmen's Bureau project with our new African American History and Culture Museum, the great initiatives being launched there. And um, the, uh, we don't have yet the, we have a postal museum. The, United, uh, the National Postal Museum is part of the Smithsonian. And we, could, we don't yet have them as a partner. Um, but we certainly, if there's interest, Herb, in, in postal uh, service memorabilia, stamps, et cetera, we could uh, double check and see if they'd like to hop aboard. Um, other ideas, now we've, Darren? I know we've uh, reached out and talked with folks uh, close to us around here, National Archives, and yes. Library of Congress, and others. And so, um, you know, we're very interested right. in having those discussions and seeing how we can work together. Right, yes. And I believe we have just recently uh, shared some of our uh, code for the underlying system with the uh, Natural History Museum of London. Um, and Megan, you can correct if... I think we have, we yes, we have. Any, but there are plans for development or using, but that would be a wonderful connection with... Um, making yep. some more consistency in transcription. Yep, we've mm -hmm. done that, and... Um, <coughs> can I get yes, a plug-in for, we, can I get a plug in for We Think Bio? Mm -hmm. I'm Paul Kimberly at National History. Oh, please, you can come. Hi. Yeah, yeah please come sit here. here. So I didn't even think about it. I, I Paul should, uh, Kimberly oh, of the Natural History Museum. So I'm one of the uh, co-organizers of We Dig Bio, Worldwide mm -hmm. Engagement for the Digitization of Bio Collections. Hello. Hi, nice Thank to you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one of our goals, is yes. to organize all of the transcription centers from around the world to have a, a global um, uh, digitization blitz. And this year it's October 20th through 23rd. And we are encouraging uh, institutions who would like to post on transcription centers to go to, um, so Digiball and Notes from Nature are the two that are the easiest for um, independent institutions to post, mm -hmm. and so yeah, that's one of one, you know one of our yeah. big goals is, is interoperability between transcription centers and um, uh, getting the word out about yeah. crowdsourcing and, and yeah. transcription. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just add one other example um, for those watching online that um, <coughs> we work very closely with Harvard University through the Smithsonian Harvard Astrophysical Observatory. And in fact, we've had our glass plate, uh, the glass plate negatives um, uh, used, started over 100 years ago to study um, outer space. We have log books related to those glass plates uh, that were um, filled with information about the wonderful uh, patterns of dots on those plates. Uh, and the 
the individuals who filled out those logbooks were called computers yeah. in their day, and they were female uh, employees of Harvard University, the Astrophysical Observatory there, which has become a Smithsonian entity. So in effect, we have been transcribing that Harvard material um, on the platform, so there is that close relationship. Fantastic. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, yeah. Yeah, do you I just wanted to mention that um, in addition to connecting, the, doing the archive work, we're hoping that this material will be useful within our museum in two major ways. We think that we are going to be able to actually link objects that we have collected for the museum to actual people who are in these records somewhere about these 1.2 million records. And our museum will also have a center for genealogy. We have the first genealogist um, in the Smithsonian and full-time genealogist on our staff. And one of our great um, missions at the museum is to help people know their communities and their families better. And there are particular challenges in doing African-American genealogy that the Freedoms Bureau um, would be instrumental in helping to solve. So that's a place where we can make a link and also we hope you know, having these records available will help genealogists all over the world do this kind of um, work with materials that remain pretty inaccessible for the most part. Great. And that was Laura Coyle of our new museum. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Megan, any other question from the group? Um, we have some sort of specific questions that maybe we, I can uh, share with some of the individuals. Okay. Here, but some things re relating to digitization best practices. Okay. Questions relating to um, specific details of item collections. But uh, one thing in particular that our volunteers always want to know is anyone could reflect a little bit further, heard a little bit of this already, but uh, specific examples of how the work that they are creating might be being used by researchers. I know that we have uh, feedback from many uh, collections managers and staff members that use the text to, to find pages <coughs> to feature things like this day in history right. um, and examples like that. Comment? I know for, for us at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, one of the individuals um, that we have been putting up um, time and time again uh, is um, a guy named uh, William Healy Dahl, mm -hmm. who did a lot of exploration uh, on the <coughs> coast. Um, uh, he uh, had a, a great interest in the uh, Alaskan territory. Um, and uh, as part of the work that he's done there and the exposure on the transcription center, uh, we have somebody who has developed a keen interest in that particular individual who's um, looking to do more research, not just here with the material at the Smithsonian Archives, but um, in the other repositories that hold that person's papers, and uh, is considering uh, publishing a book wow. on that. So, so it's it's definitely going along, and just the ability for him to have conversations with the other volunteers, mm -hmm. um, and and then with um, at Transcribe SI and at Smithsonian Arch uh, has just been great. Um, to see the interest in somebody who we already find fascinating to have somebody else find it, and it becomes infectious. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so that's one of the ways that um, the material that we have out there is being used. That's terrific. I have yes, yeah. please. Um, Camila. Yeah, I'm Camila. This was Rick Ferrante <laughs> of the archives. Um, I think two months ago, we loaded the uh, Negro Motors Green Book onto the transcription center. The what? Negro Motors Green Book. Green Motorist Green, green, green Book. book. Yeah. And um, this was a book that was a publication from the late 1930s through the early 1960s. And it was a book that African Americans referenced throughout their travels across the United States to kind of circumvent segregation and um, you know, instances of violence or discrimination. And um, we were contacted by the New York Public Library because they've got an interactive on one of their websites about this green book. Um, and they have, I think they have several in their collection. Mm -hmm. And they were highly interested in our data from the transcription center huh. because they, were, they wanted to be able to use our data and cross-reference it with some of the things that they have there and to kind of um, accent and augment what they're doing with that. So we've kind of been able to create a partnership with the New York Public Library through the use of the transcription center. 
Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, you this, is, this is Joe Hersey, oh, Joe Hersey sorry, of the, archives, the American sorry. History Museum's archives. Yep. Um, one of the uses we've got recently, we released some uh, Charles Francis Hall diaries earlier, and we've now went ahead and digitized the full collection. Uh, we just had some researchers come in who, when Hall went out in the 1860s, a polar explorer exploring Greenland. He was one of the uh, first Westerners to go as far as he went, and into Greenland to the more farther region north, and he's in search of a uh, lost British expedition, mm -hmm. and he found some of their sites where they, they were lost at, uh, some of their relics and campsites, but that was it. They are now reconvening uh, these searches, oh. and they came to archives using the material because a lot of evidence in there um, for this uh, lost expedition, and they found two of the ships, a different group did, but now they use it hopefully to find their sites, bodies, whatever the evidence they can find, how they're lost. Wow. So, wow. Keep us posted. Yeah. 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 So. I mean, there are two yes. very short uh, impacts of doing this kind of work uh, that stem from two different projects. One is the botanical specimens that we began imaging uh, about 15 years ago. As we did that, and along with the information, we found that the incidence of having <coughs> to lend them elsewhere yes. was reduced dramatically. We saw a, a three-quarters reduction in the number of specimens we were sending on loan as a result of this information being on, on site. The field book project has suffered a different kind of impact, and that's the reverse. <laughs> the more that goes up, the more contact we get about things people want. The <laughs> catalog content is there, so they know that's there, but the digital image content is not. So the number of requests have rose, risen dramatically for, for that kind of there's, there's been requests from volunteers as well, because, and the, because oh. when, sorry, when, when we transcribe the specimens, a lot of the time we come across data that's uncertain. And that's uncertain. Uncertain. Okay. uncertain. For example, the collector may very well put an Irish town down. And if you don't know who the collector is and where they're collecting, because they may not tell you, and it's just the town name, and if it's an Irish town, lots of Irish immigrants naming things after the town they came from. So you don't even know what country the specimen came oh, from. Okay. So what you want is then the field book that tells you where they collected it from because they won't necessarily put it on the little label, but they'll tell you where they've been in their field book. Mm -hmm. So I came across this very problem with Stell Fox, um, a bee collector in Ireland. The wonderful Arthur Stell Fox, he collected 90,000 bees for you and you've got them. Best collection, uh -huh. biggest collection of bees, Irish bees in as far as I'm aware, <laughs> in the world. <laughs> That's a lot of bees. He was really amazing. And he, um, but he had the same, he had the same issue. He just assumed you knew he was from Ireland and he just assumed that you <laughs> knew where he was collecting. Mm. But the guy was stunning and his thoroughness on his field books. So oh. I begged and begged to get the field books oh, in, the di in the transcription centre so I could cross-reference and you can, you can easily cross-reference on the date a bee he collected and you can find the bee in his, in his field wow. notebook. Incredible. Yeah, and then you can link the two. It's wow. so easy and yeah, it's just, it's, it's simple. It is so yep. simple and then you've got even more detail on these specimens which are at the moment, those species are either declining or endangered mm. in Ireland. So you need to have this information. Yeah. Yeah, That's a wonderful fantastic. story um, when we got your tweet saying, is there more? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so we do have the whole Stealth Fox collection. Yeah, I know. Us. I'm well aware but of that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the Field Book Project has 8,000 catalogs, or titles cataloged at this point in time and continuing. We're doing our best to, to catch up. Yeah. We have about 10% of that digitized. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Biodiversity Heritage Library, um, another one is uh, Boemel Shimmick. Yeah. Um, he's not easy though. He's hard. He's he's harder. Um, he really liked his Czech heritage, mm. so uh, he um, went overseas for the first time just as World War II was beginning to break out, um, and so recorded his experiences as um, the armed forces there were mobilizing and uh, experiencing, um, and he did half of that in Czech. Wow. Mm. <laughs> so it's kind of uh, interesting and 
we, we found a, a group of people at the University of Kansas who are very interested in that whole collection. And we reached out uh, to a number of Czechoslovakian um, uh, social communities um, in the area to help us with the check because um, it's one thing to transcribe what you see on the page. It's another thing to be able to tell if it's right. Yeah. 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 Um, so we needed people who could who could not only speak Czech but uh, read it as well. Mm. And so that was really interesting to see another group come in. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say something great um, that you know is always inspiring to me to see who's out there and using the transcription center. We don't often know very much about them, mm -hmm. but we did hear about one very interesting group of fifth grade students at an international school in Japan, Japan. who were using our transcription center to help them learn how to read and write uh, in English script. Right, Megan? Mm -hmm. And also the opportunity to explore primary source materials yep. firsthand, which are our parts of our guide. That's great. <laughs> okay, this has been such a rich exchange. Thank you, everyone. I'd now like to turn to Megan, our world-class project coordinator. Mm -hmm. Yay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Megan, if you could give us uh, just a, a brief update on how our community is doing, and we think we know the answer is thumbs up. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. Thumbs up. Um, may I have the slides, please? Just, to show just a couple of details. So in general, our volunteers continue to come uh, come back and participate with us and join us every single day. Um, uh, so far, we've had over um, 6,300 volunteers join us and work with us. Uh, uh, this is some feedback from volunteers that we've recently received. These are people who were just starting with the transcription center. This is a word cloud of the, the things that they cite. Um, which includes saying thank you, the fact that they love and like history and they have an interest with uh, working with various materials and want to give back. Um, we've come very far together over the last year, February 2015 to February 2016, and you'll see the red line that's just scooting across the top is how many available pages there were, and you'll see every month we continue to meet that goal. Our volunteers are uh, working uh, ceaselessly and mostly tirelessly, maybe, maybe taking some caffeine shots and continuing <laughs> to work. Um, uh, but we, we very much appreciate all the work that you do, volunteers. Um, thank you for spending your time with us, and thank you for continuing to make us push our limits on providing material to you. We know that um, we can only continue to grow based on your help, and um, the opportunity to share information just continues to emerge. So, so far we've transcribed over 167,000 pages together, and this is since the launch in June 2013. Um, a huge bulk of that happened actually in the last fiscal year, so every time period that we move forward, we're just growing organically, but also exponentially, and we continue to invite you to come back and join <coughs> us here. Um, also, you can um, share your opinions about different kinds of content you might want to transcribe give us ideas of who we can reach out to and what sorts of things we can bring on board, and always continue to ask your questions of us and make sure that we push me to connect you to get those questions answered. Um, again, we have 14 units and representatives of those units here, and we've had visits from over 185 countries in the last uh, two yep. and a half years. 185 countries, uh, the countries of origin for our volunteers? No, that's visits to our website. Visits to the website. Um, one thing that we love about our volunteers is they do come from around the world, but we allow the volunteers the opportunity to tell us more about themselves rather than requiring that they provide that yes. information to us. So if you would like to share your story about transcription volunteers and you want to um, tell us more about your journey to the transcription center, feel free to get in touch and we'd be happy to feature you uh, in a blog post and, and interview you as well. Uh, and then I think that was all that I had to share, just a brief update to say, you know, we, we know the challenges will continue to grow, and we want to hear from you in ways that we can make the transcription center better, a way that we can make it better for other volunteers. One question I would have had for Siobhan and us for other volunteers as well is continue to share the ways that you think um, other volunteers could do transcription, how can they get started more easily, and we'll continue to integrate that feedback into our instruction and in our onboarding process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce Chin Seng Wong of our Office of the Chief Information Officer, Head of Development for our beloved system. Thank you, Chin Seng. Well, thank you. Um, Shalom, first of all, thank you very much 
for coming and for all of the work. And you represent all of our volunteers. Thank we you. very much appreciate it. Thank you. I am here uh, on behalf of a very dedicated team, a technical team, who pour their sweat and heart into the entire project. And um, I'm, I am, Transcription Center is one of the projects that I manage, and I can't tell you how dedicated those staffs are. Um, from the day that um, I, I engaged the conversation with Rick Ferrante from Archives of American Art and Karen Weiss from, Ar uh, from SIA, Smithsonian Institution Archives, and Karen Weiss, uh, Archives of American Art, we started talking about the idea of Transcription Center. From the get-go, when the technical team got together, um, that includes and, um, many people, uh, Andrew Gunther, Richard Brassel, Randy Arnold, uh, Mike Shaw, many people together. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this is a system that can support a lot of different materials and can grow horizontal and meaning that can handle different projects in very different nature the ability to adjust data formats, the ability to output the data so that we're not locked in, so that people can use it in any um, different purposes, and also to be able to really ensure that we have the transcription text easily searchable. The purpose for transcribing is to use the material. So we ensure that the searchability goes along with the system and also be able to create all sorts of statistics, as mentioned uh, by uh, Megan earlier, so that we can understand how the materials are being used, <coughs> how the materials are being transcribed, where are weak points, where are strengths that we can uh, enrich. So we're very excited to see how the volunteers are responding to the interface that we put together, because we want to make sure that we have a user-friendly interface. And um, finally, um, we are gearing up for many large projects. As um, Megan mentioned, we have about 1,200-plus uh, projects currently. We anticipate in a short amount of time, we will be getting about more than 2,000 uh, 2, new projects. This will more than double our current system capacity. But we're committed. We want to make sure the system is up and running 24 by 7 mm -hmm. every day. And, uh, but I think what excited the technical team is because the volunteers' enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And without you, we wouldn't have a wonderful system together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That concludes our program today. We're so happy you could be with us, Siobhan. And Siobhan now is going to join with a number of local, locally based mm -hmm. uh, volunteers, mm -hmm. some folks that perhaps you've met online but will meet for the first time in person. That's right. Um, and you'll be hosted by Smithsonian Institution Archives, then by the Natural History Museum, uh, and Patricia, uh, Jessica, um, Sylvia, others um, will host you there, Paul, Robert, Rusty, you've got a whole family there. Okay. And then you'll move on to the Archives of American Art mm -hmm. where we have Kelly and we've got Karen and Mary all getting set to uh, tour you through the uh, Reynolds Center. Mm. Um, and their exhibition there, and then we're having a party Fantastic. in your honor. And so everybody around the table and certainly watching online, 545 in the Kogod Courtyard, <laughs> please come and we will raise a glass to Siobhan um, and our other volunteers. And I just Megan. want to also yes. say, volunteers, if you've been watching, we're going to continue to uh, live tweet our behind the scenes access today and share some information with you. Uh, hopefully share some images as well. So please stay tuned and thank you very much for joining us as well. Thank you.